Wow, what a testimony. Make sure that that is the testimony of your life, that, that God is all that you need. I say that in these shifting times and changing times where um, it seems as though our culture is moving further and further away from God. There ought to be somebody who still has a testimony that, that God is all that I need. Wow, glad to have those of you who are joining us around the world as a part of our online campus. We are honored to have you with us. Uh, God is doing so many great things. Well, this last, uh, last weekend, some of you may know, but if not, you haven't been watching the news, but uh, those of you watching us around the world, maybe you're in different places and you may not have known that Saturday uh, was a celebration, no, not a, a, a remembrance, a remembrance of um, the riots in Los Angeles that destroyed everything. We were, this church, we were on 61st and Hoover then, and uh, we were without electricity for almost two weeks. And during those two weeks, I, I literally moved in and shared the desk. I was on one end, he was on the other, of a man who became one of my mentors and friends and encourages Dr. Chip Murray and fame. First African Methodist Episcopal Church <laughs> became the communication headquarters. Never forget, they had satellite and, and, and uh, uh, news, news uh, organizations from around the world camped out around First AME and we, uh, I learned so much from Dr. Murray and just um, how the church must get out of the building and into the, into the neighborhood. And so, so we, we commemorate that. So Saturday, Saturday I did a, uh, this, this, this is my lesson of the week, okay? Saturday, I did a, uh, an interview. I was on radio uh, for, again, talking about the 30 years. And then, so we're talking about 30 years later, 30 years later. And uh, that was a young lady in the audience taking pictures and everything. And she had a sweatshirt on, I said, a sweatshirt T-shirt. And the sweatshirt T-shirt said, God is dope. Okay, so I remember when <laughs> dope was something you snorted or sold or pushed. And uh, 30 years later, uh, it, it ain't what you push. It's God is dope. I'm getting old, Cherry, and I'm telling you, I'm getting old. I'm in a... And, and then there, uh, I remember the song back in those days, um, uh, Curtis Mayfield. Curtis Mayfield made a song and called Push a Man. Push a Man. Some of y'all too young. And it, 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 it dawned on me, Joe, that maybe um, here, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm uh, My mama would roll over in her grave if she knew that her son was a pusher man pushing the God who is dope. Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. In, in the 40 years that I've been here, 40 years that I've been here, uh, one of the highlights, one of the seasons of five years, um, our, our youth were led by our youth pastor, uh, son of this house, son of mine, Kirk Franklin. And Kirk, for five years, for five, this is a little history, you guys, for five years, Kirk uh, commuted from Dallas to Los Angeles for five years as our youth pastor. Five years. We, we were, we being the, the large, big church, we, we were meeting in the forum. And Kirk and uh, Takeover were in this space here. And I remember one Sunday I, I, I came to look in and Kirk had a thousand kids. There were a thousand youth, a thousand. I'll never forget it, in this space, 
And, and at the point that I came in, there were, there were kids on their faces and they were kneeling and they were bowing and they were praying and they were weeping, you know, and just the power of the Spirit of God was in this house. Um, God used Kirk and God used that season. I personally know of some gangbangers. I know one particular who said, he said, Kirk Franklin and Takeover saved my life. He said, save my life. Um, and Kirk um, was a gift to this body, um, was a gift to, to music, a gift to the world. And, um, and later on, he came out uh, with a song, see, and he said, for all my people in the struggle, think God's forgotten about you, here's some pain medicine. You're in your car. You're at your house. You're on your job. Be encouraged, boo. Again, times are changing. Hey, That's enough, because y'all started moving. I, that was a wave on this side of the room, and I saw gray hair all over the place going like this, just as gray as you could be. And, 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 uh, don't y'all let this black hair fool y'all, I'm telling you. I'm trying to help you, baby. It's enough color in this room to paint a building. I'm just saying. I mean, I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So, so Kirk, so Kirk lifts up, lifts up this, um, um, this appeal, and he says, "For all my people in the struggle, uh, I want to hang out with that a little bit today." A lot of people have painted pictures of, of the church and, and Christian life and what it is. Um, they tell you, of all the other things that it is, it's a struggle. And I know many who have been discouraged because uh, they feel they've been sold a bill of goods. You know, they thought, you know, come into church and get baptized and everything and, and your life is going to be easy and sunshine all the time. But Kirk says it's a struggle. There's a passage of scripture I want to use as kind of a hangout place for a little while. Uh, it's in the book of Hebrews. And I think it frames our life uh, as believers in a shifting culture. Okay, and I'm going to kind of set this up. This, this letter to the Hebrews is written to Christians. Listen, not so much in a church or in a, a church gathering, um, not even so much in a tight fellowship like some of the other letters are written. Um, sometimes you hear him saying to the church at Ephesus or the church at this place, the church. At, this is written to believers, listen now, to believers who are wrestling with, who are wrestling with a culture that is antithetical to their faith. Okay? I'll give it to you again. This, this letter to the Hebrews is written to believers, see? But they're wrestling with a culture that, that would either pull them back from or hinder their walking in to the things of God, the Word of God. And so they, their, their struggle, their struggle is multidimensional. See, uh, it's personal, but it's also public. Public in the sense that um, the government, the culture of the times, was was again antithetical to their faith. And so Paul, the, the writer, and some say it was Paul, but but the writer of Hebrews is writing to to uh, to encourage them. 
And so, go back to that text, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, um, and, and listen to uh, this translation. And I'm going to show you later on how important it is to maybe um, look at scriptures in different translations, okay? NIV says this in verse 4. It says, in your struggle, there it is, there's our word, see, verse 4. In your struggle against sin, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. In other words, you, your struggle is ongoing. You're not dead. You, you, you haven't, you, you're still in the middle of the fight, see. And so this idea of struggle against sin, it's personal. It is, it is. But contextually, he speaks of the context of the culture. And so he is encouraging believers to be steadfast in their faith, see. Although they are personally wrestling with sin, but also publicly and, and contextually because, because the wave and the wind of the culture would shift them from their faith. And so there's a personal dimension, there's a public dimension, there's a cultural dimension of this struggle. Now, put a pin in that. Let me address another of the myths, the myths in our, uh, our, 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 our topic. We're dealing with um, this series is about the rainbow elephant in the room. Let me go back to that, the rainbow elephant in the room. And I've suggested to you that there are several myths surrounding the LGBT community or, or as I'm focusing on the SSA Christians. Let me clarify that again. I'm, all that I'm going to say today, all that I'm going to say today is directed toward believers, Christians, who on various levels and various dimensions are involved with exposed to, or in many cases, relating to, through someone else, this LGBT community. You with me? In, in, other, word, in other words, uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to say, what we've been saying the last few weeks, does not make sense okay, to those who do not embrace uh, a theocentric, bibliocentric, Christocentric perspective and philosophy of life. You guys still with me? In other words, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to declare that, that m the word is my authority. And so I'm acknowledging up front that if that, the word is not your authority, in other words, if you don't believe the Bible, then what I'm going to say makes no sense. I'm acknowledging that. Okay? Th that's my disclaimer. That's why I'm, I'm, clear, I'm using uh, Jackie Perry's term, SSA Christian, same-sex attracted Christians. And so I'm talking about this framework for those whose lives have one foot in the, in the church and one foot uh, in, 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 in this other culture. And yet, here's the myth. There is a myth, here's the myth, that those in the LGBT, LGBT community don't love the Lord. Okay, stay with me on this one, okay? There is the myth. They must be. They must be ungodly. There is the myth. Uh, whatever else, they, they, they can't love the Lord. They, they must be ungodly. The, these are myths. Okay. Um, surely they don't claim to be Christian. And sometimes we've seen in, in um, uh, protests and and. and, and, and um, you know, activists, uh, signs that say, you know, you burn in hell and God hates you and all that kind of stuff. I want to suggest um, that ain't true. I, I want to wrestle with that myth. Um, I want to do it from several perspectives. By the way, by the way, uh, and someone asked me this this morning. By the way, by the way, um, I'm, going, I'm, going to, I'm going to synthesize these few weeks, these, these times of studying uh, in, in, in my next book, a small book, almost like a booklet. You know, I, I, I never read a booklet, okay? But, but, but 
you know, it, it, in, in a bigger book, it'll probably be a couple of chapters, but, but I want to synthesize this. So I'm going to give you a lot of stats and numbers and stuff, and don't, don't trip off that. I'll, I'll, I'll put it on paper, okay? But I want you to try to understand, I want you to understand that there are myths hanging in the air about this community that in many cases turn us away from and turn us off from by our erroneous assumptions. Did you get what I just said? Is that... In other words, if we have certain assumptions, then by definition, we'll back away. And I want to address one of those myths, and I'll be, like I said, I did last week, I'll be doing this for the next couple of weeks, uh, not next week, uh, not Mother's Day, okay? But, but we're going to keep hanging in, hang in there with this for a while. Y'all pray with me, seriously, because they, they may kick us off the air today, all right? I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to be funny. So I, I, I'm serious, I need, I need you guys to pray. Because I, I want to be heard, uh, but we're going to go to the deep end of the pool. And, and so those of you watching, if for whatever reason we get kicked off, uh, when they kick us back on, you come on back and hook up with us, all right? Uh, and I'm going to write whatever you missed and put it in this booklet, okay? So you stay with me. Is that all right? Y'all all right? Okay. You, you're going to need your wading boots, wading boots today, all right? Need you to wait because we're going all the way in. Um, I want to address this myth. I, I, I want to address this myth of godlessness. Um, brilliant young writer, young scholar, uh, Dr. Derek Wade, in his, in his doctoral research, suggests, um, relative to the black church particularly, black church particularly, uh, that theologically driven homophobic messages play an important role in the socialization into homophobic attitudes and stigma. That's a word, that's a mouthful, I know, okay? Um, his point is this, that the black church, particularly, not exclusively, but the black church, is, is one of the most important institutions of influence in the life of black people. Okay? Don't rush past that. Our history tells us that. Our, our journey tells us that. Um, grandma tells us that. See, that the black church has been central to our history. Um, that's why, that's why uh, many, in many black churches, the, uh, the end of the year celebration that is most highlighted uh, is not so much Christmas, but New Year's Eve. Let me help you with that. I know, I know, I know black churches who love the Lord, etc. And they, they, do, they do Christmas, Christmas. But the big end of the, end of the year service is New Year's Eve. Why is that? Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay. Supposedly, supposedly, supposedly uh, freeing the slaves. And so he signs the document. Listen. But it does not go into law until January 1st, the next year. So all over the South, on plantations and, and plantation huts and slave huts, uh, slaves stayed up all night long waiting on January 1st because at least on paper it meant slaves were going to be free. Now, we know we're still fighting for that. That's another conversation. I ain't got time for that right now. But, but I'm just showing the significance of the black church and the history of black history, okay? And so Dr. Wade points that out. And, and he points out, he points this out. He says, uh, affirming and non-affirming to the LGBT community, the black church defining same-sex behavior, behavior as morally permissible. That there's been this conflict of on one hand affirming on the other hand, non-affirming. He says that uh, theologically, theologically, we, we have sent mixed signals. Because we say on one hand and we wink at on the other hand. Let me say it another way. Uh, we, 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 we take 
a, a, a pseudo-biblical perspective and position that, that um, nullifies and that uh, invalidates in that, that culture, and yet we have acknowledged it by saying nothing about it. I'm having a hard time explaining this. Um, don't ask, don't tell uh, has been a part of the history of the black church. And so it has often, con it has often produced confusion uh, because we say one thing. Well, some folks say one thing. And we put up with another thing. You guys all right? So this myth um, that there are people in this community who don't love the Lord is invalid because many churches are filled. Well, full. Well, have some. Uh, I'm doing my best. I'm, 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 trying, I'm trying to break this down. Can we stay real? Can we stay real? Can we stay real? Because the reality is there are those in this community who love the Lord. So there was this survey done, survey done among Christians. That's important because my focus is SSA, same-sex attracted Christians. So at, at Christian universities and colleges, stay with me now. So there was a survey done. The survey revealed that 70% of those who were Christians with same-sex attraction go to church, worship at least once a week, uh, go to chapel, uh, pray, have Bible studies, uh, value the Word of God, that's more than half of us. <laughs> that, that's more than a whole lot of folk. So it responds to the issue, to, 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 the, to the supposition that they don't love the Lord. That doesn't, the numbers don't say that. The stats don't say that. Let me go all the way in. You know some folk, don't you? who love the Lord and who are representatives of that community. Okay, let me, let me go back. Uh, of this survey, 90% of same-sex attracted Christians in Christian, college, Christian colleges saw themselves as, as spiritual. 62% um, um, said that they... They have a spiritual walk with God. Um, they experience God in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in their life, in their lifestyle, uh, through prayer and through meditation and through Bible studies. And yet they are in this community of same-sex attracted men and women. The myth is they can't love the Lord. And do that. The, the myth is, surely, surely, if they love the Lord, they wouldn't be in that crowd. All right, let's keep going. Um, there are those who love the Lord, listen to me, who are in the family of the people of God who for whatever reason are attracted to the same sex. Let that sink in for a minute. These are not people across the street, round the road, down the corner, around, around. No. There are those in the family of faith whose, don't take this the wrong way, whose thing is same sex attraction. Let that sink in for a minute. Because the myth is, surely they can't have spiritual sensitivity and be a part of that group. 
I declare unto you, that's a myth. I declare unto you, that ain't true. I declare unto you, you, we, know some folk who for whatever reason are in the community, but they love the Lord. Now listen. Which means they, they are a part of the body of Christ. Stay with me now. Stay with me now. They're part of the body of Christ. They are part of the family of the committed, the community of the committed. And they struggle in this area. Here comes my transition. They, they, they are in. And they got in the same way you got in. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord does not have a footnote or an asterisk. There is no exemption clause to whosoever. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and call upon the name of Jesus, and Jesus Lord, thou shalt be saved. There's no exclusion clause. There's no footnote on that. There's no exception clause. So let's get that straight. Uh, uh, they all came in the way we came in. You must come in at the door. So let's get that straight. Let's get that straight. Uh, there, there is, God does not have a plan A and a plan B and an exclusion clause for salvation. Salvation is an equal opportunity employer. God so loved the world except no, that ain't, that's not in there. God so loved the world that he gave. Stay with me. His only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever never believes, they came in the way you and I came in. Listen to me. But they entered into a community of strugglers. That our common ground is we meet in the commonality of struggle. Yeah, I know we're going to heaven by and by, but before you go, you're going to struggle. I know save a seat for me and all that kind of stuff when I cross, cross the Chile Jordan and all that. I got all that. But I'm telling you, before you get there, if you walk with the Lord, you're going to struggle. Uh, 1857, uh, Frederick, Frederick Douglass says, no struggle, no progress. No, our, listen, we are called not just to be saved, we are called to be sanctified. And sanctification is a lifelong process. Sanctification is growing from glory to glory. Sanctification is a process, and you fall, and you get up, and you fall, and you get up. Sanctification is a lifelong process, and it's a struggle because, because we're struggling and pulling against a culture that is antithetical to our faith. So, so they're in a struggle with us. So, so to enter the community, listen to me, to enter the church is to enter into a community of strugglers. All of us struggle. And praise the Lord, God gives us some pictures and some images to let us know about the universality of struggle. In, in, in this chapter, in this book, Hebrews chapter 12, it begins, and, and uh, Pastor, Pastor J.P. mentioned, dealt with a couple weeks ago, about uh, let us run the race at, at verses 1 and 2. And, and in verse 1 it says, we... we um, we struggle with, it says, lay aside besetting sins. It's a nice little theological term. Verse 1 says, in this, in this walk with God, stay with me, you guys. In this walk with God, we are to, we are to take some stuff off. It's a picture of, of, race, of, of running in a race, and it says, it says you, you, can't, you can't run the race in a jogging suit. I mean, it didn't say that. I just kind of made that up myself. I'm going to put it in there. Because it says you got to take off some stuff, see? And, and it says, beware of besetting sins. I love that phrase. Be, one version says, beware of those sins that entice us. 
And, and the word besetting, it speaks of uh, be, being around or being surrounded by sin. It's the sin that's always there. Uh, it's the sin, watch this. It's the sin that the culture affirms. And so my struggle is to beware of those sins that everybody else is saying it ain't a sin. Y'all make me work too hard today. Y'all please help me today, okay? He, he, he gives the Christian life, the Christian life is like running a race. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And he says you must take off some stuff, see? And one of the things that we take off is the besetting. Besetting means those sins that entice us. I'll put it another way. Uh, those sins uh, that are constantly around us. I'll say it another way. Those sins that are continually pulling at us. I'll say it another way. Those sins that are ever before our face. Let me try it another way. The sins I'm trying to take off, but every time I take it off, I put it back on. I knew I'd say something that would get y'all if y'all stay with me long enough. It's the ones I struck. See, that's the struggle. That's the struggle. And everybody, every believer has that. To be a part of the Christian race is to, is to realize that there are some things you've got to take off. And you take it off in the context of a culture that says, it's all right to keep it on. Oh, y'all missed that. There are things that we must take off, and yet there's a culture that says it's all right to leave it on. Uh, some of the stuff y'all wear. You, 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 you've, seen, you've seen anybody wear something, and you look and say, child, what is wrong with her? What? Why does she walk out the house looking? Now, let me help you. That morning, girlfriend got in the mirror. And she thought she was killing it, killing it, killing it. And she come, and you said, you all right, baby? You all right? You, you know, they say after a while, when you, you, know, you get a certain age, you, 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 you mix and match stuff. You just spit on stuff, you know. Um, and, and then your mind starts to go, you know. And then after your mind starts to go, you, What was I saying? What was that? <laughs> you, you get to this point where, where you figure, well, it ain't that bad. See, the culture that we live in says, it ain't that bad. Go on and wear it, girl. Strange, Strange, go on and wear it. Wear it, girl. Wear it, wear it. You ain't wearing it. See, see because, because the culture, the, the culture says it's okay. Now, God says, you better take that thing off. Did your mom ever tell you, don't go outside looking like that, baby? Don't go out there. See, see, it's the culture. Listen to me. It's the culture, the culture that we deal with. And so he says, he says, we live our life of taking off those things that are continually always around us. One guy calls it the well-standing around sins. The, take off the well-standing around sins. And all of us do that. You, you may have to take off something that I don't have, I'm not even wearing. I have to take off some stuff that you would never wear. But it's a part of a life of a believer. Now, I have another example, and that's in the life of Paul. That's all believers. In 1 Corinthians, Paul gives us an example of what this struggle is like. Now, in chapter 9, chapter 6, chapter 6, it's a long passage, so stay with me. Maybe you want to write it down, look at it later on. And listen, this is a, this, I want to exhort you. This is a passage I want you to read in as many different versions as you can. I'll tell you what. Because I read this in one version, and I said, that ain't me. I'm good. That ain't me. So read this in as many different versions as you can. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. This, 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 is, this is from the complete Jewish version, okay? So, so some of the words are going to be different, uh, different. Then I'll do it in another version. It says this in verse 9. It says, don't you know that unrighteous people will have no share in the kingdom of God? It says this. Don't delude yourself. Don't fool yourself. Watch this now. 
People who engage in sex before marriage, who worship idols, who engage in sex after marriage with someone other than their spouse. I heard some grunts on that one. Um, <laughs> who engage in active or passive homosexuality, who steal, who are greedy, who get drunk, who assail people with contemptuous language, who rob. Then it says, none of them will share in the kingdom of God. Don't close your Bible. And some of you used to be all of these. But you were cleansed. You've been set apart by God. You've come to be counted among the righteous, not by your own power, but by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let me give you another version. The message puts it like this. This is very important. There will be a written exam after this. I want everybody to take notes carefully. There will be a written exam. It will. Verse, verse 9. This is the message says this. Don't you realize that this is not the way to live? Unjust people who don't care about God will not be joining in his kingdom. In other words, if you don't care about God, you won't be in the kingdom in no way. I never, I never, I never wondered why people who don't believe in God want to go to, want to, go to heaven. That's another conversation I can have right now. Okay. Here we go. Those who use and abuse each other, who use and abuse sex, who use and abuse the earth and everything in it, don't qualify as citizens in God's kingdom. Then it says, and a number of you know from experience what I'm talking about. For not so long ago, you were on that list. I love this version. But since then, you've been cleaned You've been cleansed up. You've been given a fresh start by Jesus, our master, our Messiah, and our God. Now look at me. Here's his point. Some of you, will, some of you, some of you scholars would have noticed in those passages, there were a list of sins. Stay with me now. There, were a, there, was a, there was a list. And so he lists several sins. Don't back off of that. They, they were sins. And included in that list is some phraseology or some wording related to same-sex attraction, same-sex sin, homosexuality, whatever you want to call it. Okay, now listen to me. In hermeneutics or in interpretation or in reading scripture, there are often positions of emphasis based on how sentences are structured. Give it to you again. In interpreting scripture, reading scripture, and writing scripture, when, when you're writing, there are positions of emphasis. In other words, if I want to emphasize something, I put this word here. If I want to make this more important than someone else, I put it here. The, the positions of emphasis are usually at the beginning of a sentence or at the end of a sentence. Are you still with me? One more time. So in a list, in a list, it's often from the smaller to the greater or from the greater to the smaller, the greater to the lesser, okay? But in Scripture, in this list, Included in the list is sexual sin. But it's included in a list. One more time. Included in the list is sexual sin. But it's included in a list. It ain't the first. And it ain't the last. It's bad English, but it's good interpretation. Listen to me. It is sin. Rest on that for a minute. It's sin. Let that sink in a minute. Adultery is sin. Fornication is still sin. And included in this list of sins, oh, by the way, gossip. 
Uh-huh. No, I, I, let's deal with the scriptures with integrity. That, that, that's all I'm asking. Deal with the scriptures with integrity. It, it's, in, it's in the list of, listen to me, it's sin. It ain't the greatest sin. It's not the lesser sin. It's just sin. And it is sin. Don't back off of that. It's sin. But so is yours. Stay with me, children. Listen, listen. Be careful, especially of sins that don't want to be sin. The culture will declare that sin is not sin. Here's your problem with that. Jesus only died for sin. So if your stuff is not sin. I don't know whither thou shalt goest. Because my connection with God is that I have sin and his response is he sent his son to deal with my mess. If I have no mess, I need no Messiah. My mess ain't bigger than your mess. Your mess is not worse, worse than my mess. But God, hear me, children. Please hear me. God sent his son for sin. Beware of the culture that does not want sin to be sin. We have no common ground. There's no conversation with Jesus because he came for sinners. All right. We struggle like all believers. We struggle like Paul. Come with me again. First Timothy chapter one. I know there's a lot of scripture. I promise you I'm going to document all this and put it down in the book. Okay. First Timothy chapter one. Lord, help me. First Timothy chapter one, verse 15. Help me, Lord. Verse 15 says this. Paul writes and Paul says, verse 15, here's a trustworthy saying. He said, he said you can believe this. Trustworthy, trustworthy, and you can believe this, he says this. That deserves full acceptance. In other words, get this. Understand this. I don't want you to miss this. Here it is. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Stop. That's why I just said, if whatever your thing is, is not sin, he didn't come for that. He only came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you feel you, sin by definition means I am estranged from God. If what you are doing, if your lifestyle, listen to me, I'm not trying to be hard. I'm, I'm praying, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'd, I'd rather be, disagree with me, but don't misunderstand me. Okay? And that it is this, that Jesus came for sinners, sinners with sin. And if you don't fall into that category, I'm good. Because that just means he didn't come for you. Please don't hear that in some negative mean. I'm not trying to be mean, okay? But here's, here's what he says. He says, you can believe this. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Watch this, he says, of whom I, one version says, am chief. One version says, of whom I am I'm the worst. Watch this. There was a guy who was doing a paper in, in college, and he, uh, in, in seminary. He was doing a paper on this, on this passage, and uh, he, he did an exegesis of this passage. And, and the, uh, uh, the professor said, rewrite. Re in other words, read it again. Write again. And he came back, and he revised it, and he emphasized something else, you know, Jesus Christ, whatever it was. And, and the, the uh, professor said, do it again. And when he met with him debating about this grade, uh, the professor said, What's the most important word in that text? Stay with me a minute. 
he says, Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And the professor said, what's the most important word in that text? And he went from this, it was came and Jesus Christ and, 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 and you know, save sinners. No, he said, no. The most important word in verse 15 is am. The most important word in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 is am. Paul says, I am. And I ain't just hanging with him. I'm the big dog. I kind of put that in there myself. That ain't really what it says. Ain't really what it says. But he says, one version says, I am the chief sinner. One version says, I am the worst sinner. One version says, I am the first. Now listen to me, listen to me. Because there have been, there's, there's been uh, this, uh, 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 studies about that, and people say, well, Paul had a psychological uh, 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 inferior complex. Kind of psycholo psych psychological, that, that word, psychology. Try to analyze the brother. Help me out, sir. I need all the help I can get. Would you help a brother out? And so they're saying, well, there's something wrong with Paul. Paul has the bad self-image. He's saying, I'm the worst. I'm, no, no, no. Paul knew the greatness of salvation and its relationship to great sin. Paul says, not only is he a great savior, but he saved me because I'm a great sinner. One, one guy asked this question. He says this. If you are not the biggest sinner you know, you don't know yourself well. <laughs> Chew on that at brunch, okay? Paul, Paul, Paul says, I know what he delivered me from. I know how much he had to do to save me. I know where I came from. And he says, I am. Now, here's the key. The key to the am is it is in the present tense. Stay with me. The key to the struggle is, Paul says, I'm still doing it. I'm still struggling. Paul says, I'm in the front of the line. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Paul says, I'm still wrestling with this thing. Watch this. Then he explains it over in Romans chapter 7. I love this. He, he, says, he says, I'm still in this thing. Wait, what's it look like, Paul? Here it is. Here's how I struggle. Verse Romans 7, look at it when you get home. Lord, help me. He says this. Here's my struggle. My struggle is the tension between what I know and what I do. In Romans 7, Paul says, I know what I ought to do. I know what's right. I know what honors God. I know what brings honor to the Lord. That's what I know. But now what I do is the absolute opposite, contrary contradiction to what I know. My problem is the tension between what I know and what I do. I know I should, but I don't do it. And the stuff that I know I should do, by nightfall, I've already done it. And the stuff that I say I'm never going to do, by nightfall, I've done it. My problem is I know something and I'm not living consistent with what I know. I know that God hates sin. I know that I'm called to be holy. But before the sun goes down, I've done this or I've said that, and I'm still struggling. It is a struggle that I deal with every day of my life. We struggle like Paul. How, 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 many, how, how many of us? Not you. How many of us? You did it. You know you did it. And you said, Lord, if you pull me out of this, if you get me out of this mess, I ain't going to never do that again. And how many of us? You ever gone, gone, gone like this? He said, no. Oh, you remember that time I told you I wasn't going to do this no more? Can you cut a brother some slack one more time? See, those are not holy prayers. I say, y'all don't, don't, I don't pray them holy prayers like y'all. Look, can you cut a brother some slack one more time? Because Paul says, it's an ongoing battle. Lord, help me today. 
Paul says, I wrestle with it every day of my life. All right, let's go to the deep end of the pool. Let's go home. Let. <laughs> this, this brother said, how much deeper are we supposed to go? <laughs> brother said, I'm drowning already. Lord, this is a crazy church. I tell you, Lord, help me today. Come on, y'all. Be spiritual, be spiritual, be spiritual, be spiritual, be spiritual. Okay. We struggle like Jesus. Not just like all believers, not just like Paul. We struggle like Jesus. Listen to me. Whenever you study the life of Jesus, listen to me, you must always see and not ignore the synthesis between his omnipotent divinity and his anointed humanity. Give it to you again. The life of Jesus is a picture of divinity and humanity both in full. The God man is not just God or man, not man or God, God and man, not either or, but both and. And the struggle that we have is we must realize that he functioned in anointed humanity. And our, watch this now, our model for following Christ cannot be our, his omnipotent divinity. But his anointed humanity. Uh, let me help you. Um, in his humanity, see, he got hungry. In his divinity, he fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread. In his, in his humanity, he got thirsty. In his divinity, he walked on water. Now, you can go out there and try to walk with some water if you want to. I'm walking just like Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking. Because you cannot imitate his omnipotent divinity. But your, help me Lord, but your model is, I want to be just like his anointed humanity. I want to be like the Jesus who struggled and yet he struggled in victory. I want to be like the Jesus who was falsely accused and yet he came out on top. I want to be like the Jesus who was accused and hung on a cross, but early Sunday morning he got up with all power. In his, I want to be like the anointed humanity in my Savior Jesus Christ. Now, watch this. Watch this. Here we, here we go. Here we go. The Bible says that he can relate. God, I love it. Hebrews chapter 5, chapter 4 says, Hebrews chapter 4 says, we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched. But we have a high priest, and verse 15 says this, God, I love your word, who has been tempted. Get your pencils out. One version says, in every way underlying that highlighted whatever your verse says in chapter 4 verse 15 of, of Hebrews when it says we have a high priest who has been whatever it says underline it highlight it put it in parentheses put a circle around it because the phrase is in every way listen to me just as we are stop Your soteriological, your salvific, your theology of salvation is right here in this verse. Because it presents, listen to me, a Savior, say that, say there, who suffered like we suffer. Listen to me. It's a picture of a Savior, thank you, Lord, who sympathizes. I know this is long, y'all. Y'all stay with me. Please, um, please stay with me. He, he sympathizes. He can relate to our struggle with sin. Give it to you again. We don't have a high priest who is untouchable. We, we, we've had, we, we, we got preachers who are untouchable. Prophets who are untouchable. You know, we, we got evangelists who are untouchable. Can't get to them, see. 
That's what I said. <laughs> we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched. Hear me, children. But Christ, our Savior, has been tempted. Stay with me now. One version says, at every point, like as we are. Here we go. I'm going all the way in. It means that Jesus becomes my model of my struggle. Because he struggled. No, no, no. He, he struggled in every way was tempted at every point just like we have been. Now, here we go. That means he knows what it's like to stand in the tension of speaking truth in love. So when he met that woman caught in adultery, He did not condemn her. Paul says there is now no condemnation. Stay with me. But he spoke truth when he said, don't you ever do that again. Go and sin no more. Listen to me. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. Help me, Lord. In every way that we've been tempted. Okay, here we go. So being a man, he had to have been tempted with all those women around him. If he wasn't, he can't relate to my struggle. I'm going to need a life raft in a minute. I'm so far out here. Get this. Jesus must have known what it's like to be tempted to turn from someone who has betrayed you. He must know what it's like to turn to someone who's lied on you. Otherwise, he can't relate to me when my best friend betrays me. He had a Peter. And yet, before he went back to heaven, he said, go and tell my disciples and Peter that I'm back. Listen to me, children. He understands my temptation. Because the Bible says he was tempted at all points just like we are. Now, John closes the gospel of John saying, there's so much stuff that Jesus did, we can't tell it all in here. We, we can't, it, it, we, there's not a book big enough. He's, John says, I'm giving you an overview. He says, John says, he closes, that, closes his book, he says, but he did some stuff I can't write down. So I can theologically and existentially assume that somewhere down the line, Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted by someone of the same sex. If not, he cannot sympathize. If not, he cannot relate to my struggle. John said, there's some stuff I can't tell. My, 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 uh, my, my, my editor uh, been on my back for the last couple of months to write my autobiography. I said, man, I can't write it. He said, what do you mean? I said, I know too much. <laughs> I did, I did. 
He said, we want to know the inside of being a preacher and being in, music, being in church. I said, no, I can't write nothing. I, I know too much. John says, there was some stuff that Jesus did I can't even write down. I ain't got time for it. So when I come to a passage that says he was tempted at every point, let's go, Kenny, I'm ready to go. I need some help. Then I must kind of fill in the blanks and realize, well, where am I? If I feel like what I've done excludes me from the sympathy and the empathy of my Christ, I can never be saved. It's not a safe place to go. He can't relate to me. Now, he doesn't have to list everything, but I have to understand that the Bible says he was tempted as I am so that I can touch him and he can relate to me. Doesn't matter what my thing is. Doesn't matter what my stuff is. He understands my struggle. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He... So how did he do it? I'm going to have to cut this at the second service. I know it's too long. How did he do it? Listen to me. Your, your theology of sex, your biblical theology of sex, listen to me, must include the experience of temptation and the equipment for triumph. I'll give it to you again. Your theology, what does the Bible, what does the Bible, what does the Bible say about being sexually tempted? In whatever thing, whatever reason, whichever way. It must include the reality of temptation. You will be tempted. You will struggle. I don't care how holy you are. I don't care how good you look. I don't care who you are. I said earlier, some of us, I know you living holy and sanctified and filled with the presence of the Lord. I got that. I got that. Uh, I, I know you living uh, sexually pure. I got that. I know you living celibate because you ain't had no offers. Some of us are holy by default. Can we stay real in here? But my theology of sexuality must acknowledge I'll be tempted, number one. The experience of temptation. Here's number two. Yet God equips me. God, I love your word. For victory. How? I'm glad you asked. John 4 tells us. First of all, it says Jesus was tempted. Let me help you on that. Yield not to temptation for yielding is sin. Watch this. The Bible says Jesus was tempted. If being tempted was sin, that means Jesus sinned. How could he be my redeemer if he were as sinful as I am? Then how did he do it? Listen to me. We need the equipment for victory. Listen to me. But we exercise that equipment of victory, acknowledging that we have an example. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 says, Jesus, God, I love it, full of the Holy Ghost. Let's go, Donald. Let's go, let's go. Watch this, watch this returned and was tempted stay with me children please the bible says he was tempted just like we are and it goes to those various areas of temptation i could do that theologically let you know this area you have this area area you have but listen but it says he was tempted like we are tempted by the devil tempted like we are help me lord see but without sin that's our example the reality of the struggle and yet the revelation of victory. Why? How? Why? Because it says he was full of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. Being saved and sanctified and filled with the precious Holy Ghost does not exempt you from temptation. The devil will come upon your tempt come upon yourself as filled as you think you may be. It does not listen to you, listen to me exempt you from temptation but it equips you for victory how do I deal with my temptation of whatever sexual variety here it is Paul writes to Ephesians he says be filled and the, and, and the tense means be continually being filled 
So that being filled with the Holy Ghost is an ongoing process. It's more than just speaking in tongues. It's more than laying hands on each other. It's all there. It's all there. Listen, but, but it, it is practicality of your life, of walking in the power of Christ. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is my equipment. It's my power. It's my, it's my, it's my way out. Listen to me. It is spiritually, theologically, and biblically impossible to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and sin at the same time. Say that too fast. Let me back it up and say it again. You cannot be filled and sin at the same time. The reason he says keep being filled is because we are tempted and pulled to fall away from God. And yet it is that power of the Holy Spirit that brings us back. But you cannot be, if, listen, I, I know you say it in sanctified, listen, I'm going to tell you when you're not filled. You, you weren't sinned when the last time you sinned. Think of the last time you sinned. I promise you, whenever you sinned last, you weren't filled. Because you cannot be filled with the Holy Ghost and sin at the same time. So when Paul says, continue to be filled, he's saying this, every time you are unfilled, get filled again. Call on God again. Lord, fill me again. I pray a fresh anointing of the fullness, the fullness, and the power of the Holy Ghost on your life. I don't care what your sexual thing is. Whatever it is, you need the power. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we stand and withstand the temptations through the power of the Holy Spirit? How do we live holy through the power of the Holy Spirit? How do we get up when we mess up with the power of the Holy Spirit? We need the power. I speak it over your life. I declare it over your life. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've been involved with. And I don't care who you've been involved in. If you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, that's your way out. That's your way through. That's your way in. That's your way under the anointing of the power and the will of God for your life. There it is. There it is. There it is. I speak it over your life. I declare it over your life. Holy Spirit. That's your way out. That's your equipping for holiness and being what God called you to be. Here's what you need. 